So my name is Renee Hlozek. I'm a faculty member at the Dunlap Institute in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. So I like to tell people that I'm a cosmologist, which means that my job is looking at the sky the same way you do, but asking and answering fundamental questions about what the universe is made of. I'm also from the Southern Hemisphere, which is, means I'm partial to the Southern Hemisphere sky. You can see here these two beautiful fuzzy blobs or galaxies. These are the large and small Magellanic clouds. Uh, but really, if I'm honest, my job is to try and figure out the puzzle pieces of the universe. Hopefully, you will have got a sense today from the fact that we have so many interesting um, observations that we're making and also interesting questions about the nature of the universe. So if we look at this picture, this represents a timeline of the universe, and we start uh, with the Big Bang, this hot energetic phase, and we have cosmic microwave background radiation, and we know we also live today, and we're looking back in time at this history, but putting all these pieces together is not an easy uh, task, and one thing that you will have seen today is that we will stop at nothing to do it. Uh, so. <coughs> The telescope that I'm, one of the collaborations that I'm involved in is the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. So this telescope is located high up in the north, it des deserts of northern Chile, so it's 5,200 meters above sea level, and it's an incredibly dry place. Uh, we look at the cosmic microwave background again, and we measure very fine resolution uh, of these, these images to try and piece together what the, this light is telling us about the initial conditions of the universe and also galaxies and dark matter through lensing. You saw uh, that we do the same thing from the South Pole. So our colleagues at the South Pole Telescope do much of the same research that we do. And this is actually really important because um, we want to get to a deeper understanding of the universe. And that means some element of that is looking at the same things with different groups. We think differently, we approach problems differently, and we have different experiments. And this creates a really productive and fruitful scientific endeavor as we cross-check each other and make sense of things. Now, we like dry places, we like sometimes cold places, or if in the Atacama, uh, it's also pretty cold. Um, we sometimes decide, you know, what the ground isn't, isn't what we want. We send things into space. And so Bart told you about SPIDER, the ambitious project of sending up uh, balloons to measure, the, again, the cosmic microwave background. So here it's the same radiation as the, the kind that myself and my uh, colleagues measure from the South Pole, but we're doing it in a different way to try and answer slightly different questions about the universe. Um, but of course, we're wavelength independent. You heard from people today that are using radio waves, even longer waves, to understand not only the um, energetics of these really incredible extreme objects, but to measure something about space itself and gravitational radiation. Even deep underground, uh, we have experiments that are measuring the small distortions of space that come because of gravitational waves, or hunting for these incredible dark matter particles. So if there's a wavelength of light, if there's a place in the, in the, on Earth, we will find it and we will try and do science from that place. We even send things into space. And so this is a video of the Planck satellite that was mentioned a couple of times. And we sent Planck up to try and get away from the atmosphere because when you're measuring microwaves, as was mentioned before, it helps to have as little of our Earth's atmosphere between you and the cosmos. These photons have been traveling a long distance. We need to give them every break that they can. And Planck scans the sky and makes measurements uh, of the full sky and allows us to measure not only small patches, but really the whole sky and tell us something about these initial conditions and these fluctuations. And again, the physics is similar, um, but we are approaching it from every angle we can to try and make progress on these fundamental questions. We don't only learn about the far off cosmos. So I'm highlighting the galaxies that I showed you before. This is an, uh, an uh, image in visible light of the large and small Magellanic clouds. But we can look at an image from Planck uh, where those same two galaxies, and I'll go back, are now red kind of splodges. And that is because Planck is measuring the light that these objects are giving off uh, as they radiate, as the dust in them radiates. And so we can measure with different wavelengths, as has, has been described by many of the speakers today, we can use different wavelengths to approach the same objects and to learn something new about them. 
You actually notice in this uh, image a lot of cool foldings, it seems, of the image. This is a beautiful technique, but there's something scientific in those foldings that's actually telling us about the polarization of the light, um, and that tells us about our own galaxy's magnetic field. So we, only, we don't only use one property about light, we don't use its temperature, but we measure its polarization, the slight uh, uh, kind of distortions that are induced by our own galaxy and also by these early cosmic gravitational waves to try and build up this picture. We also use extreme objects uh, like supernovae in a different way. So my research actually focuses not on the, the supernovae that you heard about today, which are big, massive stars ending their lives and exploding, but a different kind of supernova. If you thought you would get away with only hearing about one cool, extreme, uh, exploding star, you were wrong. These uh, supernovae, we believe, uh, are actually happening because of uh, uh, one uh, uh, very massive uh, white dwarf pulling material from its companion. And we use these as a standard candle. So to explain why these are important, I want to uh, you imagine that you are on a very dark street in Toronto, maybe Don Mills Road, and there has been a huge uh, hurricane that knocked out all the power. So this happened in, in New York City where I used to live, and this is an image taken by an artist during, uh, during that time. So this is downtown Manhattan after Hurricane Sandy. And there were no street lamps. So there were obviously cars, because people in New York never stop, no matter what. But if you were a person like me, jaywalking, even though I know I probably shouldn't, you want to know how to, if it's safe to cross the road. And so what you do is you look at the um, headlamps of the oncoming traffic, and if they are bright, you know it's not safe to cross the road. You'll probably get hit by a car. And if they're dim, you know that the car is probably far away and you can cross the road. Everyone who's lived in a city knows how to do this. But have you ever asked yourself how you know how to do this? Of course, you learn by experience, but it relies on a fundamental assumption. It relies on the assumption that all headlamps are created equally bright intrinsically, so that you can use the difference in the brightness as a distance indicator. In fact, if you take your car to uh, get its service, they will check that the headlamps are, in fact, the correct brightness, a standard brightness. So we use this concept of a standard headlamp or a standard brightness object. And we use supernovae in the same way. Because of the physics of these explosions, we believe that they explode when they are all roughly the same brightness and have the same chemical composition. And this is an image that Scott showed you before of a very bright supernova exploding in the outskirts of its galaxy. And if we measure these objects all over the sky, they tell us something about the distance to them. And because we can measure if that distance is what we expect with or without this dark energy component that we've heard about a lot today, we actually can constrain through the expansion of space what the universe is made of. In that way, we take this complicated puzzle that seems to have no order, and we start putting the pieces back together. And we come up with a picture that starts at early times, that has this hot, dense phase uh, of radiation, and then the universe becomes opaque and neutral, and slowly stars start to form. We haven't spoken too much about that today, but that's an incredibly un uh, interesting and un as yet not fully probed part of astronomy. And then later we find galaxies form and the universe starts to be dominated by dark energy and starts to expand. And this really rich history is shown on the sky for us. You will know from today that we like pie charts. I believe there were five, uh, and I am no exception. So we have uh, pie charts that show you the composition of various things in the universe. And we go from things we know, which are always tiny slivers, to things we don't know, which are huge, cool, exciting slivers. One of which was dark matter that Mark told you about, and the other is dark energy that affects this cosmic expansion. So what's next for the universe? We know that it's dominated by dark energy now, and we'll continue, the dark energy will continue to be more and more important in terms of the total energy budget of the universe. And that means we can uh, go from the past, where we thought maybe the universe would decelerate and collapse, to understanding that the universe is going to continue to accelerate, and in fact get colder and more empty and more dominated by dark energy. And this came about in the panel discussion earlier. But what's next for us? A lot of the cosmologists that you heard from today, in fact all of us, have huge visions for the future because we strive, as soon as we've come up with one thing, either whether it be a theory or an observation, we want to push to the next level. So I'm involved in a very ambitious project called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST. 
And LSST has a 3,200 megapixel camera, which uh, is about 100 times as, as cool as your uh, phone camera. But instead of taking a tiny image with that camera, it will scan the whole sky once every three days. So LSST will be able to, me to measure a lot of these incredible supernovae and learn about uh, the expansion of space even better than we do now. I'm also involved in an ambitious collaboration between two groups that were previously competitors. So on the summit of the Atacama Plateau, where we work, and the Atacama uh, Cosmology Telescope is based, we've joined forces with another group uh, who are on the same plateau called Polar Bay, or the Simons Array, and we've become the Simons Observatory. You can see in this video my colleagues actually uh, working on the telescope and uh, uh, fitting up this is act that they're walking around on. And um, we have decided to join forces to build the next generation ground-based experiment in the Atacama. And this will allow us to take all our minds and the pro problems that we were working on that were similar and the approaches that are different and pool our resources to build the next generation experiment, which will measure this with even finer precision. In fact, we're going one step further, and we're actually combining forces a little bit further down the road with our colleagues in the South Pole. And we're trying to come up with the next experiment that will bring all of these interesting ideas together to try and say what is the best instrument that we can build to measure the light from the earliest times in the universe. We want to measure the large scales that Bart was interested in, and we want to measure the small scales um, that uh, SPT and the Atacama Cosmology Telescope were interested in. So hopefully, you will have come on a journey with us through not only the life of a cosmologist and the things that we do from both theory to data, from radio uh, data to optical light to uh, gravitational radiation and the microwave background, but you'll also have understood that the lifetime of our universe is really on the sky for us to see and that we make our lives to try and figure out the puzzle of the universe that we find ourselves in. Thanks. Thank you.